Good morning, my name is Chris Fox, and today I'm presenting a talk that I gave recently to the Central Coast Writers, which are in California, it's their local writers chapter. I had originally been scheduled to speak in person, and we were going to talk about why marketing is farming, not hunting. Um, but, you know, thanks to the outbreak of the virus that shall not be named, uh, I was unable to do it in person. And because of that, it was recorded. So I figured I'd present it here. I don't know if you guys will enjoy this. Um, as you'll hear in the talk, it's, it's geared largely towards newer authors um, who are sort of, you know, getting a, a holistic look at their career. It talks a little bit about a life cycle of a book and, and sort of how you're going to build more of a place where you can cultivate readers and uh, a little bit less. Um, how do you advertise? How do you go out there and, and find them? Um, anyway, hopefully it's useful. Feel free to watch the presentation. It's fairly long. It's like 25 minutes. Um, if it is, let me know in the comments. You know, I'm happy to, to continue to post stuff like this. Um, anyway, I'm going to get back to the writing, guys. So I probably won't say anything at the end of the presentation. Enjoy it. And I will see you next week. Okay, so today we're talking about why marketing is more similar to farming than hunting. And this is geared towards fairly new authors, um, but it will also be applicable to people who've been doing this for a very long time. So if you have not published a novel, if you've published one novel, um, then you'll get a lot out of this. And if you've been doing this for a while, hopefully you're like, oh, okay, you, you spot some things that are useful too. So before we get started, uh, who is Chris Fox and why am I qualified to teach marketing? Um, I am deeply annoyed, it's a huge pet peeve, people who claim to be able to teach something, put a course together, take people's money, and that's where their money comes from, selling courses, not from being able to actually do what they say they can teach. Uh, I can do what, what I say that I can teach. Um, I am an indie author, I'm a seven-figure indie author, uh, Amazon best-selling author, meaning that uh, a couple of my books have made it into the top 100 of the entire store. Um, and I've sold a lot of books. I'm coming up on a million sales, as a matter of fact. So, I mean, it's crazy how successful I've been since 2014 as an indie author. This is just me and my wife in our house creating novels. You know, I write it, she edits it, uh, and then, of course, I'm getting cover artwork and all the rest of the stuff that I need to get done. But we're running the small business effectively out of our garage, and it's a seven-figure business now, and there's no reason you can't do exactly the same thing. To that end, you need to set up a mindset that's going to sustain your career, and, and this is best done early, not later, because you know this is hard to change later. Um, most of us, I think, when we first publish a novel, uh, we'll look around and try to figure out what to do. Like you know, we put the novel out there. This, the, this, by the way, is my very first novel. This is no such thing as Werewolves. Came out on October twenty fifth of twenty fourteen. Um, and I looked around and I'm like, well, what do I do now? Like, how do I promote this? Well, I did all of these things. Like, this was my game plan, and it's not a good game plan, let me tell you. Um, don't do any of these things. Tell every social media platform that your book exists. No, 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 no. You don't want to go out there and tell everyone that the book exists, because what will happen is that a lot of your friends and family will pity by it. And that will really destroy the algorithm on Amazon that decides who to show your book to. Because if you write science fiction, it's looking for other science fiction fans. If your mom and your coworker Phil are buying your book, then it has no idea who it should show it to. And so your, your book just gets pushed to the bottom. Uh, emailing every person, they're going to get annoyed that you're emailing them. They might buy your first book, but if you do it on the second one, oh boy, they're going to start to get annoyed if you keep hitting them up. Uh, and then forums. like. Forums for readers are great. If you can find a forum that's devoted to your particular topic, that's wonderful marketing. Um, and I don't mean go there and, and post by my book. I mean just go there and interact. But what happens is most of us go for forums of authors, and yet that's where we advertise what our book is, even though we should be trying to find readers. And finally, if we have capital, a lot of us, when we launch our first novel, we'll buy a bunch of expensive ads. Don't do that. Do not spend a dime on advertising until you have all of your passive marketing done, until you've done all of the farming parts. The, the problem I think that we run into is that most authors are trained to think of readers like they're buffalo. We're going to go out there and bag as many readers as we can. We want to you know, get as many sales as we can. And unfortunately, not every sale is equal. Not every sale is the same. It's not all um, going to help you in the same way. And some sales can literally hurt you if it muddies up that algorithm too much and destroys your also bot and teaches Amazon the wrong lessons. It's much better to think of your readers more like an orchard and you need to be tending to that orchard. But if you do tend to that orchard, then what you'll find is your readers take care of you and that every season, every time you release a new book, they'll, they'll, they'll bear fruit, they'll buy it. So. You want to think of them as a long-term investment, not as a short-term, I got some sales. 
And that's not to say that hunting is not required. Um, I have to spend a, a bunch of money on advertising every month. I, I spend between six and twelve thousand dollars a month on advertising. Um, it's painful every time you know it gets deducted from my account, and you know I, I hate it. But you can see the number of impressions that I'm getting. That's six million pairs of eyeballs that saw my books in June for fifty-five hundred dollars, uh, and, and trust that I made a lot more than that. It was well worth the investment of that money. That hunting is something that is necessary for every author to eventually learn how to do. But don't hunt until the farming is done. So like if you've just got one book out and you haven't set up a, a reader group and you haven't set up a newsletter where your readers can sign up to hear about your fiction, um, if you haven't set up a website, if you don't have any of those pieces in place, then you should not be advertising. Make sure everything you can do for free is done. And then and only then do you start thinking about moving on to farming. Or excuse me, moving on to hunting. So what does farming mean exactly? Where's the practical advice? Like, what can you guys do that's going to help your career? Well, the first lesson, and this is a harsh one for a lot of us if we're new, uh, is you need to plant the right crop. Not every novel that you write is going to sell. If you write the wrong type of book and there's no market for it, if you are deeply into obscure poetry, you are not going to sell a lot of books no matter what you do. To use the farming analogy, if the market is buying avocados and you're planting peas, you're not going to sell any peas no matter how many you grow if people aren't buying peas. You've got to grow the right crop. Um, my book, Right to Market, covers how to do this. It's on sale right now. I put it on sale for the, the duration of the uh, pandemic. So it's 99 cents on Amazon. All of my books currently are. Um, so you can snag that if you're interested. It'll take you about two hours to read it. There's an audiobook, there's a paperback, whatever format you need. But this has transformed a lot of people's careers and, and made them into full-time authors. Because all you have to do is look at something you love. Find the intersection with something the market loves, and you're good to go. Because now you're writing something you enjoy, but you're also making money on it. You're planting the right crop. You know, you may enjoy growing peas, but who's to say you can't also enjoy growing avocados? I like horror. I like... Uh, military science fiction, I like space fantasy, there's all sorts of genres I love to write, and so when I'm picking, I, I plant the right crop based on the market and, and find that intersection with what I enjoy. I also plant many seeds, so I'm constantly running experience, experiments. Um, I'm trying different things. I am writing reader magnets, which are short stories that you give away in exchange for them signing up to your email list, um, character sheets, artwork, maps. I'm always sprinkling in these seeds. Um, and trying things. And you know what? A lot of them are not going to sprout. You're going to try a bunch of stuff that doesn't work. Your audience doesn't care about it. They're like, that's great. I don't care. But eventually you're going to do something that they really resonate with. One of the short stories you write is going to be really good, a piece of artwork or something you create they're really going to love. And you're going to learn something and you can kind of double down on what's working and, and sort of nurture the seeds that do sprout. And to that end, you want to tend those sprouts, tend your crop every day. You know, farmers don't start you know, one day and work for five days and then take three weeks off, they farm every day. And, and to that end, I recommend one 30-minute time block every single day where you're interacting with your tribe. Um, you're posting a video. You're, you're making a post in your Facebook group if you have one or a Discord. Um, you know, you're writing a short story that fans will love and then giving it to them. Uh, you work on that a little bit every day and you will find that they, they really start to resonate and really start to grow like trees do. And if you do this long enough, your orchard is going to bear fruit for the rest of your career. It never stops. I mean, that's the crazy part. It never stops bearing fruit. So this is my ebook earnings. The red are sales and the blue is Kindle Unlimited Page Reads. Um, when you layer in audio consulting, you know, paperback sales, other outlets like, you know, Barnes & Noble that I've worked with or Apple or, or Google Play, it gets even prettier. I, I've, I've had such a, a, an amazing ride as an indie author. Um, because I'm tending to my tribe. Because every time I put out a new book, people will, will go out and they'll buy it and they'll read it if they liked the previous ones. And you know, as my craft gets better and my command of marketing gets better, the orchard bears more and more fruit and I have more and more fields. You know, each field kind of corresponds to a, a series that I've written. I'm writing and finishing more and more series. And that income, as you can see, just keeps trending higher. You know, there's still some low months, but I haven't had a, an ebook month lower than $10,000 um, since 2018. And then uh, let's move into part two, um, the life cycle of a book. Understanding this will help you a great deal in planning your promo. It's hard for us to see when we first publish our first novel, but now that I've been doing this long enough, I've seen the market change and turn over multiple times, and, and it really affects us. Books are a lot more like crops than you think. 
In real world, with crop rotation, you'll plant a soil depleting crop, then you'll repeat until the soil is depleted and it can't support that crop anymore. Then you'll plant a soil enriching crop, like let's say peanuts or peas, uh, and you'll repeat that until the soil is enriched enough, and then you'll plant cotton, since presumably cotton is more valuable than those peanuts or those peas. It's the same thing with books. So if you look at the life cycle of our books, it's not that different. Um, each of these phases is fairly distinctive, and and you know they, over time you, you move from phase to phase to phase, and then you circle back around and you keep coming back to the full discount window. So let's look at, at these phases and I'll explain what I mean. Um, the new release window begins when you release the first book in your series, and it ends when the launch window for the final book is complete. So you do your big fanfare, you're releasing the very last book in the series, and everybody buys it, uh, and now the series is complete. So you think, you know, the last book in the Harry Potter series, there was a huge fanfare that came out, and now the series is over. Uh, as long as you haven't hit that point yet, you're still in the new release window. And what that means is I'm usually charging full price for the books, but I'll run sales periodically on the first few. So if I have seven books like I do in the Magitech Chronicles, I would discount the first three, but four, five, six, and seven are all full price. I'm charging full price for those books. I'm making readers pay that $4.99 because that's where a lot of the money is coming from. But eventually, you, you know, your books are going to sink in, on Amazon. They're going to get pushed down. They're no longer new content. Amazon doesn't care about them, especially now that they're no longer uh, an active series. They're a complete series. It has an ending. Fans know there's not going to be any more books. So what you have to do to get notice and sell copies is begin more steeply discounting things. And what I'll do is discount all seven books typically at the same time in what's called a Kindle countdown deal. And a Kindle countdown deal is something you can run every three months. Amazon will pay you double what they normally pay you per sale. Um, you discount your book down to 99 cents, they pay you 70 cents. And you, you just tell the free world that all of these books are on sale. So if you've got seven books in your series and you're getting 70 cents a sale and somebody buys all seven, the money starts racking up really quick. And of course, you're also getting Kindle limited page reads. If you have audiobooks available, pe people are purchasing those too. So the full discount window is very lucrative when it is working. But eventually, you're going to promote a few times on the various promo sites that are available to authors. You're going to tell Facebook, you know, you're going to tell whatever social media you're on and run whatever ads you can. Um, eventually, you've done that enough times where the market no longer cares, you're not selling copies. So then we roll into the next phase. And what I will typically do is release a box set. And this box set will have between three and four books, depending on the series that I'm writing and the length of those books. Um, if you're writing something like epic fantasy and it's super long, you could probably bundle two books and get away with it. Uh, the, the key there is length. That's what fans are looking at. And this phase uh, is, is enormously useful as a tool because it reboots things because Amazon will give you a new ASIN number on, on the book. So as far as Amazon's concerned, this is a brand new series that's never seen before, even though it's just gathering up books you already sell. And it'll promote it just like it's a brand new book. It'll tell your followers, anybody who's clicked that follow button on Amazon. It'll send out emails on your behalf, uh, along with any promotional efforts you do. So you'll see when you look at my sales graphs later in the presentation, what the spikes look like when you're releasing box sets and how crazy they can get especially if you decide to release a complete series box set. And this is optional. I'm not suggesting anyone do this. Um, this is a useful tool in my opinion, but a lot of people are, are wary of using it, especially since I charge 99 cents for the ebook. You know, it's just crazy. Seven books for a dollar. Uh, people are like, aren't you undervaluing your work? Well, as you'll see, my most profitable product ever in the history of my career is a 99 cent box set the complete Void Ray Saga. It's earned more money than anything else I've released because the, the, Kindle Unlimited, uh, the Kindle Unlimited page reads more than make up for the money lost with the low uh, cover price of 99 cents. And I also have the audiobooks available for them. And the audiobook for one of the series is 54 hours, the other one is 66. So people are all over it for that single credit. And so they just sell like gangbusters when you release the complete series. And it's worth it to me. now. This does murder the sales of all component books. Like, you're not going to sell the regular books in your series, and if fans are buying them, they're going to be feel betrayed because they they realize that there's a better deal out there than they missed out on, which is that complete series. So that's the downside of it. But you're not going to ever release a complete series box set if the books are selling. You only do this when you've exhausted all other promotional efforts, and you don't think it's going to be possible to really keep pushing the the former box set that you had. After your box set or after your complete series box set, if you do one of those, um, you, it's time to let life fallow. You've told the market enough times they're so tired of hearing about this product, so you stop running your ads. 
and you let it lie fallow and you're not trying to sell very many copies of it. Um, but you're watching the market, you're sort of deciding when enough time has passed that you can reset and start advertising again. So you just let it lie fallow for as long as it makes sense, maybe advertise another series. In my case, maybe I'm advertising the Dark Lord Burton more heavily instead of the Magitek Chronicles because I'm letting the Magitek Chronicles lie fallow. Um, but eventually you'll do a re-release. So I put out a new series in the Magitek Chronicles universe, and when I released that second series, um, I began a new phase, and so of course I re-released the Magitek Chronicles alongside of it. So you, you sort of get the stack promo where people are seeing the new content. If they like the original series, they're buying the new one. If they're not familiar with the work, they could either jump right into the 99 cent complete series or check out the brand new books, but you've got two entry points and they're finding your universe. Um, and this re-release is great. Um, but eventually that, that's going to peter out as well, and then you have to decide what phase to take it into again, usually full discount, and you're just going to make it cyclic and keep doing that for the rest of your career. Keep releasing products, keep doing box sets and anniversary editions, and re-releasing content, and writing new series, and then you know discounting old ones. Uh, and what happens is when you do this enough times, your backlist starts to look like this. So this is my military science fiction ebook income. Um, it begins in April of 2016, and it goes through the present. And you can see uh, the last book that I wrote was in July of 2017. So if you look at the graph there, you see that spike there in July of 2017. Um, everything after that, I've not put any work into the series. It's all just getting paid for books that already exist. And if you fast forward to July of 2019, you'll notice that it started spiking up over $15,000, and in fact, over $17,000. It just got crazy, and this is just the ebook earnings. So as a reminder, the blue is Kindle Unlimited page rate. So you're seeing the vast majority of that revenue is Kindle Unlimited page rates. Whereas before, if you look back to the early spikes where I was first releasing books, the new releases, people were paying full price. And so most of the money was from sales. Um, you can see how it changes where you're sort of, you're, you're leveraging different parts of the market. Initially, I sold to the people willing to pay full price with the occasional readers. And then eventually it peters out and you have to go after those habitual readers. So if you look at other series, um, my Space Fantasy, I've released more books closer together, so there's less, you know, uh, drop-off, but you do see that the drop-off does occur there as well. There's always another cliff coming. And initially, when you're first publishing books in a genre, you see that the fall is really steep because you just don't have that much content out. But the further in you get, the more it stabilizes. And this is my post-apocalyptic ebook income. Um, I have not published a book since April of 2017, so you see that spike there in April of 2017. Everything after that is just, you know, me promoting it periodically. I let it lie fallow. And here was my logic. I knew I wasn't going to be releasing book five for a long time, and so I didn't promote it. And I let it lie fallow from April of 2017 until October of 2019, so for two years. This is a great example of a fallow phase. And then I put out the Deathless Quadrilogy, which is a four-book series. I bundled up the first four books and put it out there. And you can see I got some decent sales, but mostly it was Kindle Unlimited. And then the very last month you see there, um, which is this month, uh, I released the Arc War, and that's book five in the series. You can see I'm sort of doing a re-release and kind of breathing life back into it. So what you end up with, if you're doing this prolifically and you, you have a, a big backlist, is a bunch of different series in different phases, and you promote them based on what phase they're in. And the beauty of this is if you get big enough that you can hire a virtual assistant, you can teach them how to use this to manage your backlist. So, you know, to treat it like a new release or treat it like full discount, you know, treat it like it's a, the box set and promote accordingly. Um, it gives you a set of rules that we can really follow, which I find very helpful and so it made running my career much easier. I also believe the pool of readers resets roughly once every three years. So if you promote your books today and you let it lie fallow like I did with Deathless for, for a few years and you come back into the genre, it's almost an entirely brand new set of eyes. And my logic there is most people have either moved on to a different genre or you know it's been long enough that they're willing to reread some books. All right, so that was the life cycle of a book, guys. Let's move into to how readers are similar to trees and, and how basically you, you acquire and care for them. That begins with understanding why your readers read. So what emotional resonance are they getting? Why are they choosing to read a book instead of Netflix or video games or some other form of entertainment? And when do they choose to read? How often are they doing it on their commute to work, on the treadmill with an audiobook? Um, what is their habit? You know, what do they do? How do they read? If we can understand these things, if we can understand more about who these people are, then we are far, far more likely to be able to uh, anticipate their needs and meet them. And if you meet these people's needs, they will build a career for you. 
To give them what they want, you must first know what kind of emotional experience they are seeking. You know, if you think they want a horror novel and they're actually seeking a romance or a comedy, then they're not going to like it when you start offing main characters. You know, so you've sort of got to understand not all plot twists are bad and you don't want to subvert every expectation. Um, readers fall into two broad categories, which I did mention a little bit earlier, uh, occasional and habitual. Occasional readers are like the final form of readers. Readers start out generally as habitual readers. When I was a kid, I just binged books every day from age 8 to 23. I was reading a novel. I was a, a habitual reader. Well, these days I'm an occasional reader, and I've interacted with enough of them to understand what it is that motivates them. Occasional readers are not afraid to pay full price for books, they, they, and they'll pay them for all of them. So if you've got a good series, they're just going to keep buying it at full price every time a book comes out because they know you're going to deliver a satisfying experience. They're extremely loyal, but only to that specific series. If you were Jim Butcher and you have the Cinder Spires uh, or Codex Alera or some spin-offs, you know, they're not going to buy those. They're only going to buy the Dresden Files. Uh, they typically, occasional readers will only read a few books a year because they have so many just competing forms of entertainment. They care far more about the quality of the experience they're getting than the cost. Uh, to a point, so if you got to be, you know, they are somewhat price conscious, but they're willing to pay a much higher sticker price. They're not going to bat an eye at four ninety nine, you know, for book six in a series. Um, they're extremely difficult to woo because their time is so valuable, and they've been suckered so many times that they don't trust anybody. Um, one of the things that will convert them most readily, though, is a uh, is a what, Chris? Is a recommendation from a habitual reader. So habitual readers are great because they'll tell the occasional readers, "Oh, this was a cool series," and then occasional readers will find it and buy it all. Um, and I found they really love Audible. So occasional readers, because they only go through a few books, uh, they get usually the one or the two credit a month plan. Uh, they're much more occasional readers, I think, that are on Audible than there are habitual readers. Those are those are the Kindle Unlimited people. So when we look at habitual readers, uh, they tend to read a book or more a day. They just chew through them. They're more interested in always having another book to read than having a five star experience. This was me. I would have like three or four extra books in my bag, and I, you know, if one was bad, I'd probably read it anyway, just because I didn't want to not have a book to read. I was extremely price conscious. I got a paper out to pay for books. Today, um, people can be in Kindle Unlimited, and a lot of them are, or they pirate books, but they're going to be very price conscious, and so that's something to be aware of with habitual readers. They love 99 cent books or Kindle Unlimited, but they'll devour your entire backlist. In my case, that even includes the nonfiction. So, like, they'll start with werewolves, and then they'll read about space, you know, dragons in space, and then they'll decide they want to be writers, and they'll read all the nonfiction and, and just devour it all. The downside is they don't ever stop doing that, and so when they're done devouring your backlist, six months from now, they have no idea who you are because they've done the same thing with like twenty-seven more authors. Now, regardless of which group you you are are trying to cultivate, I recommend both, but focus primarily on one because how you market to them is going to be very different. And try to figure out, you know, identify your readers. Which of these groups is more important? And learn more about them. What are they into? What shows do they like? What, you know, books do they read other than yours? Try to learn as much as you can about them and, and their reading habits. And then build a community where they can hang out. This is also how you can learn it. If you can get 10 or 12 of them initially to come show up, you know, by sending out a newsletter, and they get in there and you start asking questions and running polls and interacting with them, you'll learn about your audience. They'll tell you about them. And they'll start welcoming other people, and you'll kind of grow a community over time. And all you have to do is give them some free stuff now and then. Nurture your community with that daily action we talked about. Make a post, write a short story, make a video update, uh, and then you're going to reap the rewards. So one of the things that I've done, one of the big services I've provided that's taken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of my time is I built them a world online. I built a, oh, it's kind of like a Wikipedia page. It's called World Anvil. And it has maps and character sheets and all the rules for the role-playing game are up there for free. So if you, if you don't want to buy the game, you can just play it by looking at the website. And what the, the fans did for me after I put this up and gave it to them is they paid me back by funding my Kickstarter to the tune of $30,000. We're still receiving funds. We have a, a site called Backer Kit that allows us to keep taking uh, pledges until the release date. So it's, it's just amazing that fans are just piling in with cash to get this game produced because they want to see um, the Magitech Chronicles RPG come to life. You know, I've, I've built something great for the fans, and the fans have come back and tried to help me turn it into a reality. 
we really, really can work with our tribe. So if you're a farmer, if you treat it like it's an orchard and you're planting a bunch of apple trees, this is the fruit you're going to bear. And you're going to bear it every season. Like this won't be the only Kickstarter these people contribute to. It won't be the only book they buy. Every time I do something, if I keep treating them really well and I keep giving them stuff and I keep making sure their needs are met, they're going to do great things for me. And there are some stunning examples of this out there. Um, I keep promoting this. I can't shut up about Critical Role, but I, this is the best example I've ever seen of looking at a tribe where you just give them content, nothing but content for years, and then when you finally ask for support, they pay you back in spades. Um, Critical Role, basically they play Dungeons and Dragons on camera. They're on a Twitch stream and they stream it out to their audience and they have millions of people watch them play D&D. And you know, they're really into characters and they have a lot of supporting information and they provide a whole bunch of extra content. But you know, there's enough there that people can spend as much time as they want in this universe that Critical Role has created. And so when Critical Role said, hey, we'd like to make an animated series, the audience said, great, do it, here's $11 million. You know, now that series has been picked up by Amazon. I mean, you can see that some gamer geeks came together and made this happen. And, and there's no reason we can't do similar things with our own audiences, even if it's a little bit on a smaller scale. If you get to a point where you have a thousand people that support you every time you put anything out, um, you, you right off the bat, every project that you ever do will be profitable and then you just start selling it to the wider audience. So you get that thousand super fans and life is really good. Uh, anyway, that's the, the presentation. I blazed through it as quickly as I could to leave as much time as possible for questions. I find that in most of my talks, I get a lot of questions. I will invite you to ask questions, not just about this presentation, but about any of my books or anything else that you want to know in general. Uh, all right, let's get to the questions.